Yes, Sarah. Producer, let's do this. Yes, producer. Mm -hmm. I, I believe God, God can, can, can do, do it. it. I believe God, God can. can. Hard, Hard to see, let his children through it. it. I believe God, God can. Who else could, could take, take Moses' can? can. Save, Save him from, from the Pharaoh's plan. plan. He came toward the promised land. I believe God can. Yeah, I believe God can. I believe God can do it. I believe God can. Sit down, love to prove it. I believe God can. He is the blind man, made him see. The children come to me, take the wind and come the sea. I believe God can, yeah. I believe God can. See the Lord. I believe God can, can do it. I believe God can. Touch my heart and I shine through it. I believe God can Hold me with me every day Hear me every time I pray Teach me how to live His way I believe God can, yeah I believe God can I believe God can I believe God can So let's begin to pray so, Father God, we help your support. You, God, do not like your most songs are not godly. God can help you in your faith in you. God's praise sings to you. You sing for the Lord as well and help for the sick and hurt. You pray for them and bring comfort many people you know. God is with you all the time. God got this. He will. He is the Lord. Do not be afraid. God is with you. He will be with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord. How many musically inclined people do we have here today that heard him miss a key? <laughs> Missed a note. Out of tune, one could say. God uses out of tune people. God uses a missed note to bring us into the thought that it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be about perfection. It has to be about a willing heart and an opportunity to be about the Father's work. Thank you, Kevin. Miss a note on purpose next time just to see who cares and see where their thought is.
is their thought about you and their thought about what song and, oh, I can't sing. No, no, no. Yes, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I had a gentleman at a church. He got up and he said, I, I know you guys get weary of me because they would ask, does anyone have a word or anything they would like to say? And he would stand up and he said, I know you guys get weary and tired of me saying this. He said, but until the Lord releases me from it, I'm going to say my word is love. And he would talk about love for a few minutes and then sit down. Do you remember him, Michelle? He would. And God said it every Sunday. He would get up and say, let me tell you about love. And maybe those were the seeds that were planted so deep within me at the beginning and in the middle and now in the end where that fruit has grown and plants have been harvested. The website called Real Women Ministries was quoted as saying this in relationship to the scripture that I'm going to reference today. It says, using these definitions, we can see how this verse comes alive with new meaning and depth. And then they went on to translate it in this way. For I will put an end to the weary soul and to every indifferent lacking soul, I will supply fresh fuel. I don't know what translation that was. I don't even know if they actually referenced the translation or if they were simply putting it in their relational context, putting it into their practical application for the need in which they were faced at that time. But it said once again, for I will put an end to the weary soul and to every indifferent lacking soul, I will supply fresh fuel. The scripture in which I'm referencing and to which the Real Women Ministry made this statement in that it came alive to them using these definitions, I'm going to preach expositorily today. That is to say, I'm going to pick apart each word. I've done it before, and I like doing it. It ministers to me. It brings it into perspective, brings new meaning and depth to a particular scripture. And that scripture is Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 25. And as you're writing that down or turning there, Jeremiah 31 and 25. Let me set the stage. Israel, at the beginning of this book, had committed two great evils, as it says in chapter 2 and verse 13, that they had forsaken God and that they had created broken cisterns in which water could not be held. I believe that's talking about people where God's spirit could not reside. Their land had been desolated and they were a people of a rebellious heart. They had unjust leaders and they made unacceptable or even unholy sacrifices. They found themselves defiling God's house. The entire nation was disobedient and as you draw close to chapter 31, they chose death rather than life. And wise men spoke falsely. But then we come drawing near to where we're at today and we see that God's everlasting love is extended. Where he says in Jeremiah 31, 25, For I have, and if you're reading in the King James Version, for I have satiated the weary soul, and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. So let me break down and bring into context each one of these words, and maybe, just maybe, and in hope 
just hoping that it will minister and be applicable to a life, whether it's yours or somebody you know, where you can encourage them or be encouraged. So for I have satiated. One could say that's an awful big word for such a small church. I love to be able to enunciate each word as I've taught our children and say, sound it out. But this one, as you look at it in the King James and you try to learn it, it's simply say, she, ate, id. <laughs> say, she, ate, id. It is actually meaning satisfied. For I have satisfied. But as is the case with the King James writers, they did not choose to use the word satisfied, and rightly so. For satiated has a deeper meaning. In the scripture, this word satiated does mean to be saturated and to have or to drink one's fill. It comes from several different words and meanings, but it means to be drunk or to be intoxicated. Not from the sense of it's okay to partake of the liquor, but in the sense of, guess what? Well, if you were me in today's world, it probably would, but for ease of the conversation here today or the illustration, we will say it would take more. Most people sitting down to drink and eat with a great big coarse meal at a beautiful dinner at a wonderful gathering and they share a bottle of wine at the first glass would find themselves unintoxicated. Would you agree? And I say that, of course, not with me, because after I stopped drinking many years ago, and rightly so because of the condition I found myself in, more than likely if alcohol were to cross the very portals of my lips, I would find myself intoxicated at the first drink. But that's not the point I'm trying to make. This word satiated goes beyond satisfied or saturated. It goes in from satisfied to saturated. In that it's implying that you are to be intoxicated and drunk. I can look over here and I know you know where I'm going because <laughs> we've been drunk before at times in our life. And I'm sure that many others in here know this feeling of I'm going from a social drink or maybe even a communion gathering where I'm going to partake of a drink, but I'm not going to be drunk or intoxicated. When I was in the military, my soldiers, I was most of the time trying to be a good sergeant and a good leader once I got promoted to that level. And uh, before that, though, that's a whole other story. But I would always be, okay, I'm going to be your designated driver because I need you in formation on Monday morning. I don't need you in front of the captain's desk seeking out punishment of Article 15 or, and being court-martialed. And I need you out of jail. I need you at the motor pool. And so I would do what I could to keep them out of harm's way. But there were occasion where I would say, today or tonight, I'm going to get drunk and belligerent. And that was my full intent. But I knew that it would take more than one drink. That is the implication that it's saying here. That it would take more than just one drink. So for him to say, for I have satiated, I have done more than saturate, I have taken it to the level of such a degree that one is drunk and intoxicated. Based on your body mass and your body weight and your age and your level of intoxication, 
elasticity that your body can endure, it may take more for one than another. And that's true within Christianity. A new believer may be able to get enthralled within the confines of Christianity and God's presence so quickly and rapidly at just the drop of the slightest puff of God's hand and move. But somebody who's been in Christianity for so long, they've seen that little puff of wind and God move go into turmoil and destruction and walking away and turning away that they find themselves, I'm going to wait it out. Okay, let's see what that firecracker does. It is just going to pop and sizzle and go away so they don't get so intoxicated so quickly. You see where I'm going with this? This is why it simply didn't say, for I have satisfied or that I have saturated, but I have satiated. For I have satiated, because then it puts it into each individual's life. It puts it into your statement. It puts it into your place in life. It puts it into where you are and what it takes for God to bring about however much it would take. And unfortunately, one could bring it into reality and what we would understand intoxicated or drunk. That's the level of saturation, satisfaction, satisfied, the implication of satiated being stated here. It also means to drench, to water abundantly, We've seen that here. <laughs> you barely get off the road and you are stuck. The other day in the driveway, I was turning around and I had the trailer and I barely got my left wheel off of the gravel. I had to put it in neutral, put it in four-wheel drive just to move because the ground was watered abundantly. That is satiated to saturate, to water abundantly, to cause to drink, to satisfy. It then could be read and rightly translated in many different versions to read this away with these first few words. For I have fulfilled your desire. For I have met your expectation. For I have met your need. For I have put an end to your hunger and thirst. But it didn't say any of those. It didn't put any of those definitions. It didn't do any of them. It simply said, for I have satiated. Now we understand the meaning of say she ate it. A hamburger or a hot dog. <laughs> say she ate it. That's something we could send to Jeff Foxworthy. Worthy. Let's say she ate it. <laughs> Let's say she ate the whole box of chocolate. <laughs> now hopefully you'll remember that now. Let's say she ate it. Oh, I felt the spirit just Put that right in your memory bank. Satiated. So the next time you find yourself as they found themselves in Israel doing two great evils or found their land desolate and their broken cisterns not able to hold the loving water and living lands and were desolate and they had a rebellious heart and their leaders were unjust and they were making unacceptable sacrifices and they defiled God's house, then you can stop and remember that here God has shown His love and He said, but satiated you. For I have, and then what does he satiate? For I have satiated the weary. Now let's just stop there because I know for me the definition of weary is probably something different than what it is for you. 
But what does it mean in the Scripture? For I have satiated the weary. That weary means the faint, the exhausted, the famished, and the thirsty. A dry and thirsty land. A weary soul, thirsty. The woman at the well, when Jesus said, I will give you water that you know not of, that when you partake of this, you will thirst no longer. And she said, give of me this water that I would not have to draw from this well anymore. He said, I talk about a water and that's going to give you an everlasting thirst quenching punch that you don't even know about that weary soul that weariness maybe because we are searching for something greater than our own maybe we are thirsty for simple righteousness maybe we're thirsty for truth or understanding maybe we're thirsty for peace Maybe we're thirsty for a cold glass of water. Thirsty. Maybe we're famished. Anyone ever been hungry? It goes beyond hunger. Famished. Famished is when you've been hungry... And then you hungered because you were hungry. And then your hungered because you were hungry turned into pain. And then your pain because you were hungered when you were hungry turned into swelling of the abdomen. And then the swelling of your abdomen because of the pain because you were hungered of your original hunger goes on satisfied that's famished exhausted have you ever found yourself physically exhausted I'm sure the people who run a vacuum cleaner and dust the windows and care for a child, make dinner, clean the house, go to a construction job, work in a warehouse, load and unload trucks, go to a manufacturer's position, find themselves in a taxing mental job where they're constantly engaged in their mind. Any one of these, you could agree that, yes, I've been exhausted. But how about that exhaustion that we find ourselves in, like I've done many cases and times before where I just walked out of a hospital from being with somebody and I just simply stopped right where I was at and I knelt down in the road. And people stopped behind me and, hey, hey, are you okay? And all I could say is I'm praying. Really, I guess I was saying I'm exhausted. I just poured out everything that was in me. And now I'm exhausted. I've given every ounce of life and physical endeavor that I could help somebody. And now I'm exhausted. Alicia said today, oh, my leg, how much more? Oh, well, you got another leg, two arms, an eye, a head. <laughs> there's a lot more. <laughs> yes, there's a lot more, but th- 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 that's not exhaustion. That's pain and probably unbearable. That's hurtful, but the exhaustion that's coming through the Scripture that he's referencing is I can't take anymore. 
I am at the end and I need help. Moses, at the time of his age and at the, after leading the children of Israel for all those years, found himself exhausted. And it was said that the people helped him and raised his arms for him. And that as they raised his arms for him, things would happen and God would move on his behalf and then they would lower his arms for him. He was exhausted and needed help from others. This is the picture of exhaustion that is portrayed here. For I have satiated the weary soul and I have replenished to replenish. To me, when I think of replenishment, my dog food is running low. I've scraped the very last bit of dog food. I need to fill it back up. The oil that I cook with, I need to replenish it. A lot of times we shop at Sam's. I talked to a friend of mine the other day. He shops at Costco. And I don't shop at Costco, but I shop at Sam's. And we had a good debate between Sam's and Costco. The point is that in both places, it's meant for bulk quantity. And so when we buy in bulk, we will have this bulk item, but we keep the little item on the counter. And that's what we pour from. That's what we daily use from. And as it gets low, we will take from the bulk item. You know where I'm going. We will take from the bulk item and replenish the low item. We replenish it. That's what I think of. Well, let's see, the Bible says. The Bible says of replenished. For I have replenished means to be full a fullness, an abundance. The scripture tells us that we are, or it is, that our cup is so full that it runneth over. For me to replenish means I'm going to stop shy of the top. Especially when dealing with the honey my daughter likes to use honey in her coffee and I like it in my tea. But I don't like it running over and sticking on everything. So we make sure we don't overfill it when we replenish it from the big bottle to the little bottle. But the word as God has given it, the definitional term is overflowing. So he has not just simply in our human eyes replenished it to the fill line, but to the overflowing line. It's the uh, country song that says, I'm drinking from my saucer because my cup has overflowed. To be full, to be accomplished, to be ended to consecrate and to fill the hand, to be armed, to be satisfied, to be accomplished, I think I said once uh, before, to be complete. I don't know that I've ever considered to be complete or associated that with being replenished. To confirm. That's a powerful one in my opinion. To replenish. To make full or complete again. To supply with fresh fuel. As the Real Women Ministries had said. For I have satiated the weary soul 
and I have replenished or completed, gave an overabundance. I have put an end. I have armed you. And I have confirmed you. That is every sorrowful soul. Sorrowful. To become faint. Sorrowful. I've only fainted once in my life. Sorrowful. To become faint. I've shared it in my testimony when I fainted. And it was at the death of my daughter. At the announcement and the proclamation, when the doctors removed their instruments and turned off the electricity of it and said, there's nothing more we can do. We pronounce her dead. I fainted on the spot. Sorrowful. He's replenished every sorrowful soul. Sorrowful to become faint, to languish. I took it further and I said, okay, to languish. What does to languish mean? What is to languish? To languish is, in my opinion, to, to kind of mope around. To languish, to, to, to be lacking, to, to, to hold back, to be in the back. But as I searched it out, languishing is lacking in spirit or interest. To be indifferent it means wasting away. That he has replenished that soul that is wasting away. And when you put it into the context of the woes, as I indicated, of what Israel was going through in the first 30 chapters, their nation was wasting away and being destroyed. And yet God did it. God came through for them as a nation. And he's promised to come through for us as a people. As engrafted into that nation. Engrafted into his promises. We should be and are a sorrowful person. In that language, it also means to be indifferent. I then went down and defined indifferent. So I defined not sorrowful only to languish, languish to indifferent, and indifferent means having no particular interest or sympathy. You're unconcerned. You're mediocre. You're neither good nor bad. That, I believe brought it into the widest possible sense of humanity. That it doesn't mean that you're the Jew or the Israelite. It doesn't mean if you're in Palestine or in Christiana. It doesn't mean if you're white or black, old or young, big or small. It puts it into everyone's court. It then could be translated to say, For I have satiated the weary soul, I have replenished you. For each one of us should find ourselves at some point in our life in that sorrowful state. And if we do not, then I would submit to you as Scripture has mentioned many times before those who will reject Christianity for they have no need of a savior for it clearly indicates that there are two types of sorrow in the Bible those that produce regret and those that produce repentance 
Regret is the condemnation that will draw you further away from God and deeper into the sin of this world. Repentance will draw you into conviction, which draws you at your knees to the cross and closer to God. Sorrowful soul. Last word to define the soul. The soul, as mentioned here in this scripture, Jeremiah 31, 25. A soul means the self, the life, the creature, a person, an appetite, a mind, a living being, or even a desire, an emotion, a passion. All of these are defining your soul. Maybe I'll date myself. That brother's got soul. Have you heard that? That brother's got soul. What they were saying is look at his passion and his emotion and his desire. His appetite to get down and boogie. (laughs) Did I get you to smile? That brother had soul. A soul is what breathes. A breathing substance, a being, the inner being of a man. A living being which has life in the blood. A self, a person, or an individual. The seat of the appetites. The seat of emotions and passions. The activity of the mind, the will, and the character. Your soul. So it is within the deepest recesses and the exterior presentation of our emotions and our will and who we are, as that one song says, dance like nobody's watching, sing like nobody's listening. That who we are when we're not hindered by, well, don't let nobody see you do that. Or, oh, I can't go and do this because I'll be embarrassed. I'm talking about who you are. Not not who you are in me or not who you are in him or not who you are in the workplace or who you are in the church house or who you are in the car. Or I'm talking about who you are in total. That is what is being satisfied and satiated and brought about. So having defined all these, I'll simply repeat again the scripture, for I have satiated the weary soul and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. Now let me bring it into practical application of his timeless principles and read with me chapter 31 and verse 26, the follow on verse. Upon this I awakened, and behold, and my sleep was sweet unto me. What? All of that was a dream? All of everything I hoped and wished, and you replenished, and you brought me out, you showed me new, you brought me through, and it was erased because I woke up, and now I'm in reality? That, ladies and gentlemen, is where we find ourselves every moment of every day. Guess what? You have to wake up. I was watching a sci-fi movie not too long ago, maybe a year, well, a couple years ago. And in this sci-fi movie, they were asleep and living vicariously through some other um, um, like uh, digital media life. And one person decided to wake up out of this sleeping state and they found all these people asleep and in these computer world minds and they didn't want to get woke up because they liked the dream world they liked the make-believe they liked operating in the pretense that everything is a-okay 
They liked with the understanding of, I can think it, therefore it is. Well, the Bible does say that as a man thinketh, so he is. But the reality is, I awake. So what do you do when you awake? You remember the dream because God gave it. He said that He will give dreams and He will give visions. And He is speaking to you and I through them. We don't dismiss them. We hang on to them. But the dreams must line up with His Word and His Word is that vision to us. His Word is that we do can and we do and can hang on to verse 25. And we can say, but she aided. I have been she aided. My weary soul has been replenished. My sorrowful spirit within me has been awakened. Not just raised from the slumber of sleep. But we are walking in this world with that hope. That blessed assurance. That my sleep was sweet unto me. But what about when you're awake? What then? What then? I encourage you today to let that same sweet sleep be present when you're wide awake. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the words that you've instructed with me today. I thank you for the statements that have been spoken. I thank you for the encouragement and the the words of wisdom and the authority in which it was given. And now I pray your Holy Spirit would do that which I cannot, but that you would encourage a life. You would speak to the soul. You would implant unto them seeds and water and, and encouragement and nourishment. And Lord, that you would mold us and make us. You would bend us and stretch us and break us if needed, but awaken us. Yes, Lord, give us the vision and give us the dream and encourage us as the word said and illuminate our mind and our understanding that we can have that hope and that purpose and that possibility of the promise. But Lord, give us that same strength when we awaken. Give us that same sweet sleep attitude when we're wide awake in this world and faced with the trials and tribulations. May we stand firm in the resolve and the understanding that satiated. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.